So uh, what I want to regale you with today is a, uh, really an extension of Barbara's talk, uh, a footnote really, if, if you will, about the situation that we're really in and why. Um, so I'm going to slide through a few of these uh, slides quickly because of the time limitation. And I will be, just to warn you, I will be reading two of them. So uh, that's just ne necessary. But we have a list of uh, scientific mysteries here. Um, and uh, I've organized them somewhat randomly. Uh, we have in particular, a very unusual one this year, eclipse anom anomalies. And uh, right outside that door and to your left, you will see a pendulum that relates to that and relates to the workshop on Sunday, which I highly urge you to read about at the very back of your program, because it's really going to be a unique and fascinating thing that ties into a one-time uh, amazing eclipse on the 21st of August um, through the United States. So just as a tip for that. We have, we have uh, my mysteries involving uh, the nature of consciousness. Uh, involving uh, how we can heal, how, we, how our bodies interact with the world. Um, mysteries involving things we shouldn't be able to do or see or know. Uh, mysteries that defy classification. And I divide them into that our field is to, to expand the boundaries in three areas. What can be perceived or experienced or imagined? What can be altered by intention? What can be learned about anomalous experiences? So I've kind of classified them that way. What can be perceived? You have ESP or remote viewing, clairvoyance, dowsing, near-death experiences, uh, and, and UFOs and alien abduction also have to do with how we perceive things. Uh, what can be altered by intention? We should not be able to alter the things that can be altered by just intention. Um, and there's non-human in intention involved in post-mortem survival, hauntings, poltergeists, and so on and so on. And finally, what, what can be learned about the way we experience these anomalous phenomena? Uh, the study of first-person inquiry, uh, the study of altered states of consciousness, of paranormal belief, what causes someone to believe and experience in this. What happens when someone is traumatized and suddenly these, these abilities get, get clicked on, turned on? And we have a variety of centers for this work. Uh, the ones in white are the ones that are no longer with us, including Yale's and, of course, Pear. The Ryan Research Center at Duke, the first one. I, I was there while it was still in operation. And a number of these are, are really pretty, pretty weak in terms of an ability to conduct um, original research. Um, and ours is really, really the strong one here. And we don't really know what the Department of Defense is doing, although may, maybe John Alexander can tell us something about that. <laughs> um, so, so this is what it's kind of down to. Um, and so the question I have is, um, why does mainstream scientists tell us, close that door? And so, again, the one I was going to read, in contemplating these mysteries, what seems equally mysterious is the accountable lack of official interest in the investigation of such uh, anomalous phenomena. Anomalous, why? Because they cannot be accounted for by the prevailing model of reality. What keeps such phenomena from being universally deemed among the most important research topics of the world?
there's a scale, there's a continuum. And it starts, this is a cartoon representation. Um, let's see. Here we have sociology at the far end. Sociology is just applied psychology, but psychology is just applied biology, but biology is just applied chemistry, which is just applied physics. Way over here, oh, mathematics. And so that, the idea of that, uh, of that <coughs> continuum is, extends to more and more and so, softer and softer um, ways of looking at learning. And so we have the soft humanities sliding toward the real thing, right? Hard science, objective, third person, data driven, quantitative, double blind, randomized, also naive physicalism and unintentional metaphor. The justification is that hard science yields deep facts and grants. Soft humanities yields opinion and the imaginary. Hard science yields salvific. It's our savior. Soft humanities yields intellectual property to be sold through iTunes. What is science as we know it? A set of methods, a set of findings, and a set of ethical principles. That's what science is. What is it not? It's not a belief system that relies on unwarranted presuppositions and unacknowledged. It is not a filter to establish a boundary between what should or shouldn't be explored. And it is not the possession of gatekeepers and priests who control careers and funding. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what controls all this. And I think of it as a tower, the metaphor in my mind for the regnant paradigm, which we've all heard about for 50 years from Thomas Kuhn and his followers. I think of it as a tower, towering over us. And it's that regnant paradigm is what I call a mimetic system. And I'm going to go through this quickly because many of you are familiar with meme theory. In general, memes are cultural forms that are perpetuated in a way parallel to or similar to Darwinian evolution of biological forms. And in doing so, they form systems. And if they do so, they survive better. They do better. And there are some of them that become so successful that they, in effect, appear to be parasitic on their hosts. And we are their hosts. A mimetic organism is, an, for example, an ideology that convinces you to give up your life or give up your family or give up something really precious, give up your soul. It operates like an organism that seeks to flourish at its host's expense. And it has a life cycle. It starts you know, at the end, at the, at the bottom here, we call it a cult or a, mo or a movement. Right now we have the trunk cult forming, you know. We're so blessed to serve you, Master. You know? um, then if it, if it prospers, if it defends itself, if it continues to strengthen, if it chokes off its rivals, it becomes an ideology or a religion or even a way of life. And finally, if it becomes completely <coughs> dominant, we call it just the way things are. It becomes invisible. It disappears. What was the, what was the belief system of the German people during the height of Nazi glory. 
just the way things are. What was, what was the ruling dominant paradigm in medieval village in Europe? It was just the way things are. If we discover a new indigenous tribe, what will we find? They don't have a religion. It's just the way things are. The world is filled with spirits and taboo and whatever. That's just the way things are. If that's the case, could that apply to us? Could we be living under such a system, such a mimetic organism, parasitic to humanity? If it were true, how would we know? We could know because we would be able to spot a collection of related memes that's de aggressively defended, even though those memes have no solid ground. They're not warranted. They're unacknowledged presuppositions accepted as truth. Secondly, they would have defenders that aggressively defend their right to control what we think. And number three, one or two of those related memes, which seems peripheral and insignificant, but are actually essential to the entire system. And what could they be? Those essential memes invalidate any possible ideological competitor. So before the game even starts, the regnant system has ruled out competition, just the way a very successful biological entity might be able to do so. Three seemingly insignificant memes determine just the way things are. Number one, the physical is mostly real. That's, sorry, just the way things are. The, the non-physical is in the category of imagination, creativity. Any limit on science and technology is intolerable. In fact, it threatens our very human nature, which is to pursue the limitless without, without reservation to conquer the physical universe. And number three, the most peripheral, the most to the side, coincidence is meaningless, right? It's just a coincidence, you know? I don't care how many times you show me the anomaly, the remote viewing, 300 times. Doesn't matter, it's just a coincidence. The odds, 30 billion to one synchronicity. Three pairs in a row in that context. Just a coincidence. <clears throat> uh, okay, I, I just, yeah. What is coincidence? It's random. And in this belief system, that means it's meaningless. Because meaning cannot originate from randomness. Why? It's just the way things are. Why would you want to study? Why would any of us want to study things that are inherently meaningless, superstitious? And yet there is nothing within science that determines that coincidence must be meaningless. That order cannot emerge from randomness, from picking up three pairs in a row when you're talking about the pair institute. That is a matter of faith. Now there are, in my view, three causative states. There's determinism, there's intentionality, and there's randomness, which is neither one. It's un randomness is unpredictable on an instance by instance basis. When you throw that coin, you don't know what it's gonna do the next time. And yet, over time, we have faith that it will average out. 
If I toss a coin a million times and it comes up heads, I, that's not an anomaly. Just keep tossing until it comes up 50-50, then you can stop. That means that the only source of meaning is intention. And we are the only source of meaningful intention. Therefore, only we create meaning. There is no larger source, greater source. There's no underlying field. It's, it's, it's us. Thus, the paradigm establishes humans in the place of God's, the sole creators of meaning, the sole creators of truth itself. This is the payoff from the regnant paradigm. This is what it delivers to you. You are it. You may be the cancer of this planet, but you're the crown of creation. <laughs> to be as gods. When did we start wanting to do that? I'll tell you where it first appears. Genesis 1. <laughs> to be as gods. That's the carrot. The stick is what we feel when we apply for grants or recognition or plausibility, I suppose. Even these windows up here, if you see over there the man pointing, he's identified as science. He's pointing to uh, some sort of imperfection in her argument. She, on the other hand, is, is us, reaching out for acceptance, for grant funding. <laughs> And, and this woman over here is, is straining to hear the announcements. So. This is, Lump, by the way, Lewis Comfort Tiffany. Thank you. Well, that's the payoff. So let me summarize by saying, in metaphor, not in, not, not, I'm not saying literally there's a secret monster running our lives. It's an alien force. It's a metaphor, I think. This planet has been taken over by a non-human parasite for which humanity is the host and the agent, and we call it the regnant paradigm. That's what we're up against. Around this idol are arrayed aggressions and defenses because it's competing successfully to maintain its exclusive dominance of our mind space. As just the way things are. This metaphorical entity is in the process, as I speak, of sacrificing the entire biosphere to its altar in exchange for a promise to be as gods. Any possible challenge is neutralized in advance as just a meaningless coincidence. Therefore, I call it the cult of the meaningless coincidence. The secret, hidden, invisible. Only the emergence and detection of meaning from randomness can break the spell and break free. So what we do is we encounter anomalies which are in the nature of coincidence. And throughout the ages, those coincidences have been what warrants belief systems, what warrants religions, what warrants ways of life, are those anomalies, those coincidences. We maintain that coincidence can be a source of meaning. We maintain that reality is a superset of the physical. Thank you very much. I see a certain problem with this objection to meaninglessness because um, I would argue that the the notion of meaningless events was, is actually one of the most important 
scientific, philosophical, and moral advances of the last 400 years that in traditional cultures, and this is not just characteristic of Western history, but all over the world, uh, when people are convinced that everything happens for a reason, whenever anything bad happens, they start looking for who made it happen. Oh, my uncle got sick. Well, where's the witch who cursed him? That, I mean, we're, we're, we're familiar with that from the 1600s in Europe, but uh, it is characteristic. Of, of cultures all over the world. And I think that the notion that started to arise during the Enlightenment, but only really took hold with the discovery of quantum mechanics in the 20th century, that there are events that have no causes and happen for no reason is an is an important cultural antidote to this urge to blame specific other people for anything bad that happens. Thank you. Well, let me just back that up by saying that, uh, of course, randomness is an absolute necessity to double-blind, you know, to, to orthodox research. It depends on random um, survey participants, uh, random polling, uh, the double-blind process is about randomness. So the funny thing is that we, that that's where the meaning comes from. If you remove the randomness from a double-blind experiment, you lose the double-blindness. So, so it's it's a very it's a weird you know randomness is weird. And so on the one hand, I agree with you. On another hand, science itself is saying it's meaningful in that way. It's necessary. Um, I'm not sure exactly why we thought Hillary Clinton was going to win the presidency, given the power of randomness, but it failed us. But anyway, thank you for that clarification. Okay. George. Um, I'm George Gantz. Uh, James, you've done a nice job of anticipating some of the things I'm going to say on, uh, on Saturday. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask you about, okay, we've got this monster, this cult, and uh, I want to see if maybe there's an Achilles heel, and whether the Achilles heel is science itself. And it has to do with the idea of when, when you sort of talked about the principles of science, one of the things I didn't quite see there is, um, you know, science is trying to figure out what nature is telling us, you know, what the world is telling us. So yeah, there are paradigms that we impose and, you know, there's the, the Kuhn idea of the paradigms and all that stuff, but, but we're actually here as scientists to see what is nature really telling us. And if you look at the fragmentation that's taking place in the frontiers of science, the anomalies that are all over that um, it, it almost seems like maybe if science actually continues to pursue the frontiers and those anomalies, that uh, the cult will end up uh, being destroyed from within. So I wanted to ask whether you think that might be. Well, uh, Barbara helpful. was somewhat pessimistic about that after X decades. Um, I, I think basically what I wanted to say is that this isn't just some set of policies or administrators that we're up against. This is something really, really deep in the culture that's taken things over. Um, and I think that, I think that Q, you, you cited Kuhn, and that's good too, because it is possible that there will be a new openness as generation faces these problems and seeks answers in new and different places and seeks the roots of the situation we're sailing into. So, uh, When you showed the, uh, uh, the scale of the scholarly enterprise, 
Uh, you represented it in a lin in, in a linear fashion that started out with the humanities or whatever and went over to the, uh, the queen of the sciences, mathematics. I just want to point out that maybe if we drew that as cyclical, we would realize that mathematics itself is pure consciousness. There ain't no numbers out there. It's, uh, it's a cognitive thing. I'm not putting it down, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, but it is a mental creation. And therefore, it should be at the beginning of that line rather than the end or as part of a circle. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Barbara. In, in 2010, <laughs> in 2010, we had a conference here. Uh, we, had, we brought in uh, 80 of the top, supposedly, theologians, philosophers, and cosmologists to debate why is there anything. <laughs> we got a grant for that. I don't know. Um, and um, there was only one thing that everybody agreed on. And that is that mathematics is a cognitive system, but it maps something that is platonic in the platonic realm. So I think that, that your point is very valid, though, that mathematics is considered Beyond, you know, hard, hard, beyond hard science. And yet, it's completely metaphysical. So I agree with your idea of the circle. Thank you very much. Thank you.